My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. And today in our boasted modern civilization, we are facing just exactly... December 8th, 2021 marked the 80th anniversary of an auspicious moment in American and world history. The bombing of Pearl Harbor, which sparked the United States' entry into the Second World War. Pearl Harbor also marks the end of the story in David McCain's new book, Watching Darkness Fall, FDR, His Ambassadors, and the Rise of Adolf Hitler. FDR, of course, being Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose voice you hear at the beginning of our podcast episodes in one of his campaign speeches on social justice in 1932. In addition to his efforts to tackle social justice through the government's New Deal programs, President Roosevelt is also known for steering the United States in the face of Europe's descent into a second total war in 20 years and subsequent U.S. involvement in that war from 1941 until its conclusion in 1945. David McCain's book tells this story through a historical examination of four U.S. ambassadors to European countries during the 1930s and their respective experiences, perspectives, reports to Washington, and relationships with President Roosevelt. William Dodd, U.S. Ambassador to Adolf Hitler's Germany from 1933 to 1937. William Bullitt, Ambassador to the Soviet Union and then France during this period. Breckenridge Long, Ambassador to Italy from 1933 to 1936. And Joseph Kennedy, Ambassador to the United Kingdom from 1938 to 1940. In this bonus episode of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy's podcast, Diplomatic Immunity, I spoke to David about his book. David is a prime example of a diplomat who draws on both academic and practitioner perspectives in his work. During his career, he has been an author, attorney, political advisor, and diplomat who served as U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg from 2016 to 2017. Prior to that, he was Director of Policy Planning at the State Department from 2013 to 2016 under Secretary of State John Kerry and also served as the director of the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development Review under Secretary Hillary Clinton. He is a recipient of multiple high-level awards from the Department of State and spent many years working in the U.S. Senate. Let's listen to the conversation. And remember, if you like what you hear, you can catch up with all our previous episodes on our website, isd.georgetown.edu, or in your preferred podcast app. Welcome to Diplomatic Community. I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is our special bonus episode for season three. And I'm excited to have with us today David McCain, who has worked at the Department of State and uh, was an ambassador as well. And he's got a new book out called Watching Darkness Fall FDR, His Ambassadors, and the Rise of Adolf Hitler. Welcome, David. Thanks so much, Kelly. Delighted to be with you today. So uh, I, I, we were just talking before we started recording, but I really enjoyed the book. Um, I thought it was great. And there's been a lot of stuff written about FDR, obviously, over the years. But this book does a great job of sort of taking a different tact and, and different angle to it to focus on uh, his relationship with some of his extremely important ambassadors during the 1930s. Speaking of the 1930s, the book basically begins with FDR's election in 32 and ends with Pearl Harbor. And this is arguably one of the most important decades in not just American history, but world history is in the lead up to, to World War II. Can you kind of provide an overview of the challenges that FDR faced when he took office and how those shifted over that 10 year period? Yeah, sure. You know, at the time, of course, Roosevelt was the governor of New York, confined to a wheelchair, and he decided to run for president because he really believed that the United States was in a dire situation. And we were really in the midst of a severe economic depression. There was 25% unemployment. GDP had fallen to levels that uh, compared to the uh, turn of the century. Um, banks were closing every day. There, were, there was a run on banks. People were being displaced and uh, having to move out of their homes. It, it was a very, very tough time in the United States. And, you know, Roosevelt's such an interesting character because he had such sort of optimism that he was, he had this uh, just extraordinary ability to give people hope. But the truth is he didn't have a um, real economic plan at the time. He believed that if the United States could 
increase its trade, if he could stabilize the banking situation, uh, then he could, you know, hopefully provide some stability to the economic situation. But it was a it was an incredibly difficult time to be assuming the office of, pre- of president of the United States. And I have to say, the other thing that's you know interesting is that when he ran for president, he didn't talk about foreign policy really at all. It was almost entirely focused on uh, what was happening domestically. And the United States at the time, uh, let's not forget that this was only a dozen years after World War I had ended. Um, and it, we were in a very sort of isolationist mood at the time. The American people did not want to be involved abroad. And uh, Roosevelt understood that. And uh, as I say, he was uh, very reticent to enter into any discussion of, uh, of an overarching American foreign policy. There really was no overarching American foreign policy at the time. This, of course, all changed during the course of the 1930s. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too. You mentioned the, the neutrality issue and the isolationist issue, and there's, you know, FDR actually even signed neutrality acts into law in the 1930s, and then just a few short years later is is trying to basically trying to lead the public with him along with him on this ride, understanding what was happening in Europe and the fact that you know he knew it early on that the United States wouldn't be able to stay aloof from what was happening in Europe. But he had to sort of bring folks along with him over the course of the late 1930s and even into 1940, 41, as the war was going on. That's exactly right. I mean, we, you know, it's 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 very interesting. Again, for the, for, the, for the first, really during his first term, he avoids foreign policy as much as he can. Any discussion of foreign policy, except that he wants to increase trade and he wants um, the countries of Europe to pay reparations that were owed from World War One. But Roosevelt, uh, again, understood the mood of the country. He does sign neutrality legislation in both 1935 and 1936, which effectively says that the United States should not be taking sides in what is clearly becoming a, a, a fraught situation in Europe. But then in, you know, in 1937, he's talking to his uh, attorney general, Frank Murphy, and he says, look, I, I know I signed this legislation, but what can we do to circumvent it? <laughs> Which is sort of extraordinary uh, because he understands that at some point the United States is going to have to become more involved. And, you know, you, you sort of uh, mentioned this issue of, of, of leading the American public. I mean, one of the, one of the great quotes in the book that is uh, when Roosevelt sort of is trying to get the United States just a little bit more involved in the affairs of, of Europe. And he wants them to join not the, uh, the Treaty of Versailles, but to, but to at least to join the, the world court. He loses terribly in the Senate, um, both he loses uh, his Democratic base in the Senate and Republicans vote against it as well. And he says to um, one of his aides, he says, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing to want to lead and to look behind you and see nobody's following. So, you know, Roosevelt was always cognizant of that, too. I mean, I think that's a really sort of important quality that he had, that he was someone who um, wanted to bring the American people along on whatever agenda that he set forward. But he knew that sometimes it took time. He knew that it took education. He knew that it took cajoling. And so that he was, uh, in many ways, very careful politically. Yeah. And and the, the really interesting part about the book is that Roosevelt's not the only character we meet in this story. And the real heart of this, uh, of the story you tell is about his relationship with U.S. ambassadors to European countries during this time. And when I was reading this, it really, as somebody who worked in the State Department, but also as a historian, it reminded me how intimate diplomacy and the conduct of U.S. foreign policy was at that time. And many of the interactions that that uh, these ambassadors, and you talk about William Dodd, who was the ambassador to Germany, who Roosevelt didn't know ahead of time, but was a well-known uh, historian from the University of Chicago, and then William Bullitt, who was in Russia, and then France, and then uh, Breckenridge Long, who was in Italy, and then had a lot to do with uh, immigration issues uh, as the war started. Um, you know, these are folks that he knew he knew much better, um, and even had some family connections with. And Bullitt, in particular, is just fascinating. Sort of the relationship that FDR has with him, and some of the, you know, the the types of letters that he wrote to him, and things that he said in these letters was. I couldn't imagine it something like that today, um, but uh, but it's fascinating. And then uh, at the other end of it, you have this person that sort of fits in the middle that Roosevelt knew, but not 
extremely well and didn't necessarily like, um, but was a well-known figure in some respects. And that's Joe Kennedy, who's, you know, the father of, of JFK and Bobby and, and Teddy. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to focus on, on those guys, the, those four, and just kind of talk about that relationship? Sure. Well, you're right. These are sort of the four principal characters in the book. And I focused on them because they represented the United States and the four most important capitals in Europe. Um, it was really that simple. You know, William Dodd, uh, I'll begin with William Dodd. He was a uh, very smart guy, intelligent. He grew up in a small town in North Carolina, went to Virginia Tech, but um, eventually became the chairman of the history department at the University of Chicago. He'd written a very um, well-received book on, on Woodrow Wilson, which was very complimentary of, of the president. And he was working on a history of uh, the South when he got a call from Franklin Roosevelt to become uh, the next ambassador to Germany. And I should just add that, you know, he wasn't Roosevelt's first choice. <laughs> Roosevelt had actually been turned down by three or four prominent statesmen because, because the president wanted somebody of real stature to represent the United States in Germany. He understood, number one, that Germany had been obviously an adversary in World War I, that it was important to have a relationship with that country so that the country did not fall back into the role of being a, a militarized aggressor. He also recognized that Germany owed the United States a lot of money, and he wanted somebody to c collect those reparations. But William Dodd was, was still, he was, a, he was something of an odd choice. I mean, he spoke German because he'd lived in Germany for a year, and he'd been recommended by one of Roosevelt's cabinet. But he had no political experience. He had no diplomatic experience. He didn't really understand Washington um, politics, and he didn't understand German politics. And so he, uh, you know, he was a he was confirmed on a voice vote in the Senate. Never even had a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is would be a little unheard of today. And off he went to to Berlin. And he started out really trying to be sort of this very neutral individual who was going to just take a take a broad view of what was happening in German society. But he quickly became disillusioned with the Nazis. And Hitler was at the time not actually, did not have full control of the party uh, and of the government. But by 1934, he did. And it was called the Night of the Long Knives when Hitler instigated this purge against others in the Nazi party. And um, it was an extraordinary event. A lot of people were killed and imprisoned. And Hitler seized power. You know, from that point on, and, and after a couple of meetings with Hitler, Dodd really recognized that this was a, a madman. He learned that Hitler was, in fact, going to remilitarize Germany. And so he tried to warn Roosevelt about this. And Roosevelt took, you know, took it on board. He understood. But again, at the time, the, really the policy for, um, for American ambassadors was not to interfere in the affairs of, of other countries. You were there to really to simply to... Uh, to report back what was happening. And so Roosevelt was, again, he was taking this on board, but he wasn't doing anything. Because Dodd was sort of an oddity in the State Department, he was also not taken terribly seriously. And m many in the, in the department's higher echelon um, sort of dismissed him as uh, a lightweight, that somebody who didn't really um, understand international affairs. And so that uh, he, he felt he was unsupported in, in Washington and certainly in Ber Berlin, he understood that the Nazis didn't like him. <laughs> and uh, he, he was being, uh, you know, he, was, he, was, he felt he was being wiretapped, being followed. He vowed after um, witnessing what was happening to German Jews to never have any really dealings with the, uh, with the German hierarchy. So, you know, he was sort of a captive in, in, uh, in Berlin at the time, and he decided to actually uh, leave the State Department in 1937. And he continued to speak out, but he's, a, he's an interesting character because he was the first one to sound the alarm about Hitler. Uh, Breck Long, who became the ambassador to Italy, is an entirely different kind of person. He had a, an office across from Franklin Roosevelt, who was the assistant secretary for the Navy um, in World War I. And he had an office in the old, what is now the old executive office building, just down the hall from Roosevelt. And they became friends. And Roosevelt was Harvard and, and uh, Breck Long was Princeton. And he had a very distinguished background. And he was also a real political operator. And during 1932, he helped Roosevelt, um, helped him as a floor manager at the convention, uh, organized Missouri for him. He was a very, uh, you know, very good political um, tactician, and Roosevelt liked him. 
And so Roosevelt sent him to Italy. Again, he you know, was confirmed easily by the, by the Senate. But Long was somebody who was sort of easily impressed, I would say, by uh, other people who were wealthy and by the sort of trappings of the job. And so he had this uh, beautiful house in, in Rome and he met with Mussolini and he writes to one of his colleagues that this is a man of astounding character. He tells uh, Roosevelt that he thinks Italy, you know, he visited Italy as a young man. He says it's completely different now. He says that the fascists have done a marvelous job. He actually says the trains run beautifully. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as we all know, the tra- Mussolini made the trains run on time. So he's a fan of Mussolini's. And by the way, Roosevelt, it's not that Roosevelt was not a fan. Roosevelt, you know, had hoped that Mussolini would play a, a, a constructive role in, uh, in Europe as a, as a leader. But after the invasion of Ethiopia by uh, the Italians, really for no rational reason, Roosevelt really turns against um, Mussolini and um, Long doesn't. But he's uh, brought back to the United States. And in uh, 1940, he's made an assistant secretary of state for administration. And it's a different, it's not the same role today, but he's really managing the State Department. And one of his uh, roles is, or one of something that's central to his portfolio is immigration. And Long does everything he can to keep European Jews out of the United States. And for that reason, I say that he is probably the worst appointment that Roosevelt made in, in his entire administration. William Bullitt, as you noted, uh, Kelly, is the uh, first ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the uh, Soviet Union. He's there from 33 to 37. And then um, from 1937 to 1940, he's the ambassador to France. He has this extraordinary career. And he'd had an extraordinary career before he was appointed an ambassador. He, At the age of 28 or 29, he had uh, been uh, negotiating with Lenin in Paris at the Paris Peace Talks. He'd written a novel in 1926 of, that was sort of loosely based on Lenin that actually sold something like 150,000 copies. It outsold The Great Gatsby, which was published that year. He'd become friends with um, Henri Matisse in France during that period. He, uh, he was a real, he was sort of a bon vivant, but he was extremely intelligent. Yale graduated, knew European history, knew European foreign policy. Roosevelt didn't meet him until uh, 1932, but there was an instant affinity between the two men. And uh, Roosevelt, uh, after he was elected, he gives, uh, he gives an aide a sheet of paper and he says, uh, on, the, on the sheet of paper is, a, is Bullitt's name. And he says, I want this, and, and a few other names. And he says, I want this man in my, uh, as an ambassador. I want him in, in the State Department. Bullitt wants to be ambassador to France at the time, but that post is taken. So he becomes ambassador to the Soviet Union. It starts off well enough. Uh, he has this rather amusing introduction to um, Stalin, which I uh, talk about in the book. But again, uh, he quickly becomes very disillusioned with the Soviets and with, and with the, the uh, leadership of, uh, of the Soviet Union. And uh, he is also wiretapped and uh, followed, and he finds that he has no ability to influence anything. And he feels that the Soviets are lying to him at every stage. So he, uh, he, asked us to, he actually asked to come back and work on the election in 1936. Roosevelt um, brings him back just before the election, and in 1937, is, he's made the uh, ambassador to France. And he again, he's well received there. He uh, is becomes very uh, close to the um, different uh, leaders of France. And to his credit, after initially thinking that there might be some sort of re- rapprochement between Germany and France, he advises President Roosevelt to rearm quickly because the United States at the time had no military. And uh, he says, you know, their war is inevitable. He doesn't think actually that uh, France will be defeated, but he does believe that the United States is in danger. In 1940, he is actually credited after the invasion of France with saving Paris. And I have there, that's, this is a fairly well-known story, but I, I, I go through it again in some detail in the book. As you mentioned, he writes, a, he writes a number of letters to, to Franklin Roosevelt that are, you know, they're, they're so personal. And he, he talks about how he misses being with spending time with he and Mrs., you know, with the president and Mrs. Roosevelt because they really gave him a home in the White House. He talks about being at his country estate outside Paris and saying, you know, I wish you were here tonight to, to listen to the nightingales and see the river by the moonlight. I mean, they're, they're sort of romantic in a way. 
And, you know, Roosevelt is, uh, likes him enormously, but Roosevelt's not easily flattered either. And eventually the two men have a falling out. Joe Kennedy, as you suggest, Kelly, is, a, is an entirely different, you know, entirely different relationship with the president. They'd known, also known each other since the First World War. And they never really liked each other. Although Kennedy supported Roosevelt in 1932, and the president made him the, uh, you know, the first chairman of the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. And Kennedy did a terrific job, brought in some very, very uh, accomplished young lawyers who, who helped him and helped to really you know, write the economic ship uh, for the United States by making sure that the financial institutions were secure and safe. He wanted to be the secretary of the treasury and Roosevelt wouldn't let him have the job. So in, uh, he eventually um, leaves the SEC and decides he's, maybe he's going to go back into business. Roosevelt asked him then to become head of the Maritime Commission. That's actually a step down. But Kennedy is a, you know, he's a loyal person and he accepts the job. Again, he does quite a good job. But at a certain point, he tells Roosevelt's son, he says, listen, I'd like to be the ambassador to the court of St. James. And Roosevelt at first thinks that's a, just a nutty idea, but eventually he appoints him. And the question is, why does he do this? And I think there are a couple of reasons. One is, I think he's, he, he figures, he, Roosevelt has some disdain for the British government. He thinks that, again, there's this gathering storm in Europe and that the Brits are really not recognizing it. They're not doing enough. He thinks Kennedy can shake it up. And the other thing he believes about Kennedy is that Kennedy has this, uh, who is Catholic, has this enormous following in the United States. He's a very, very rich guy. And he worries that Kennedy actually could be a potential contender if Roosevelt decides to run for a third term. So he wants to get him out of the country <laughs> and appoints him as ambassador. Doesn't really give him any you know, sort of serious instructions what to do. And so Kennedy takes it upon himself to decide that he's going to make policy. And he is uh, somebody who believes we, he doesn't admire Hitler. He doesn't like Hitler. But he thinks we need to come to an, uh, and some sort of accommodation with Hitler and that we need to have, uh, that we perhaps we can establish an economic relationship with Germany that will ultimately save Europe. But as things deteriorate in Europe and as things particularly in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom and London is being bombed, he's increasingly viewed as a defeatist. And he is. Um, he doesn't change his views. And uh, he, gained, he gets the reputation of being an appeaser. Eventually, he resigns. But Roosevelt has, uh, has succeeded in keeping him away from politics. In the end, he, he, uh, he he's continues to, uh, Kennedy continues to support Roosevelt. So it's this, uh, as I describe it, you know, it's sort of this interesting chess match between these two master politicians. But the game is really stacked against uh, Kennedy because Roosevelt's the more powerful player. And Kennedy does a lot to injure himself. So those are the four ambassadors. Um, they're, a, they're just a fascinating group. And, and I, I wrote this, you know, using as much as possible their memos, their letters, and their diaries. I think the, the result is a pretty interesting story. Yeah, as I noted, I, I think you did a wonderful job of integrating those letters and, and memos and things into the book. And thinking back specifically to Joe Kennedy, it's almost scandalous today to read in retrospect some of the letters and their discussions, uh, whether or not it's the defeatist attitude or, you know, Breckenridge Long and some of his discussions that you mentioned about Mussolini and others. And and uh, even Joe Kennedy Jr., who, who Joe Sr., you know, sends him on a sort of a European tour that you talk about. And some of his glowingly uh, positive letters about the Nazis and what they're doing in Germany in the mid late 1930s, it's just kind of uh, jarring to read that today it, with some of the mindsets that were going on back then. But changing tack a little bit here, um, so you mentioned in the opening of the book that it is also about America's struggle at that time to define its role in a changing world. And that immediately kind of brought me back to today. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on sort of what we can take from that period uh, as the United States sort of tries to figure out some of the same things today on, on where it fits in a changing world. Yeah. So, you know, that's a, that's a really, a really good question, I think. You know, I would sort of start by saying that you have to kind of understand the United States at that time, that we were very much a self-contained country between two massive oceans. And this is before the internet. It's before, really, it's before television um, and so we were we were very much a, um, an isolated country, and you know Roosevelt um, understood this. 
And I think he was, as I say, I think he was searching for, uh, for America's role in the world. He didn't believe the State Department was a particularly effective institution at the time, by the way. We had, uh, at the time, there was about sort of 700, I think, diplomats. They were all men. Um, there was a supporting, a supporting staff of over 2,000 who were mostly women. But the men who served in the department, and we had, we, you know, we covered, and we had 60 missions abroad. And Roosevelt knew a lot of these individuals. I mean, again, they were sort of his ilk. They were upper class. They were Ivy, Ivy League educated. But Roosevelt felt that instead of sort of making a mark on advancing you know, the United States, they were marking time. He thought they were an entitled bunch that, that in many ways the State Department was sort of a playground for these, for these individuals. And so, um, you know, he wanted to, uh, I think, have a more energetic, forward-leaning foreign policy. And near the end of the book, I talk about Roosevelt um, getting together with Churchill in uh, Newfoundland off the coast of Canada. And the two men uh, immediately liked each other and, and, and they, need, they needed each other at that time. Churchill desperately needed uh, American help because London was being bombed mercilessly. And um, you know Roosevelt understood that if England were to uh, capitulate, if it were to be defeated, that the Nazis would next come to our continent. And so um, the Atlantic Charter is really this extraordinary set of principles that the two men lay out. And you know they talk about self-government. It talks about the sovereignty of nations. Um, it talks about free trade. There's also uh, a section on, on uh, freedom from want, which is essentially, you know, uh, an extension of Roosevelt's domestic policy, the four freedoms, which he, he laid out, which were freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of want, and freedom from fear. And it also talked about clearly and obviously about disarmament and making sure that this would never, the kind of war that had happened during the First World War and that was underway now during uh, the, a war in Europe. That that's that this would never happen again. So I think he I think Roosevelt had understood that we needed again to to play a much more forceful role in the world, um, that the United States was a strong country, and that we could we could in many ways le be a leader with, with our democratic values. And so it's it's to me it's a real turning point in uh, in American foreign policy and in American history. Yeah, you also mentioned the role that uh, FDR's personal history played in this as well, and his experiences uh, in his foreign policy and his views. And I was wondering if you could sort of, you know, fast forward 75, 80 years or, or whatever it is, and, and sort of to your experience in the State Department and as an ambassador as well. And, and how did you see that playing out in in, in foreign policy today and, and uh, how personal history plays out, um, whether that was with your interactions with Secretary Kerry or uh, you personally as an ambassador? Sure. Well, first of all, let me actually let me start with with FDR. You know, FDR was was an internationalist um, in many ways from uh, from his youth. He, he traveled abroad with his parents to Europe uh, frequently as a child. And then again, as I've mentioned, you know, he was the assistant secretary for the Navy during the First World War. And he actually had thought about running for president, and uh, he talked to his his older cousin Theodore Roosevelt, who told him um, this is this is some years before. Who told him, you know, um, you've got to serve in the military. So Franklin wanted to do that and felt that it was very important. But but Woodrow Wilson told him, I'm not moving you from the the position of assistant secretary of the Navy. However, you know, if you want to go to Europe and look around. <laughs> That's fine, and so Roosevelt did, and uh, he saw the devastation of World War One, and it had a profound effect on him. He actually gave a speech in the mid '30s at Chautauqua. Uh, it's called the "I Hate War" speech, and even though Roosevelt hadn't served in the military, and that it wasn't clear from his speech whether he had or he hadn't, by the way, but you know, again, I think it was. I think he honestly did hate war. I think he was somebody who who recognized the devastation and that it it, it represents represented the failure of diplomacy. The the point of all of that, by the way, is that I do think he had real international experience before he assumed the job of president. And I think he always understood that the United States needed to be more involved, um, whether or not you know the the politics delayed that at certain points, but he always felt the United States needed to be uh, more involved in international affairs. 
you know, from my point of view and, and working for, for John Kerry, I mean, um, uh, and he's got his own autobiography, it was published a few years ago. And he talks about, again, as a child, you know, sort of similar experience to Roosevelt, because his father was a foreign service officer. He lived in Europe uh, as a child. He talks about riding into East Berlin on his bicycle. Um, and obviously, you know, he had, he served in Vietnam. And by the way, when he was elected senator, I don't know any other senator that has done this. From day one, he asked to be on the, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And he served on that committee the entire time he was in the Senate. That's not something that every senator uh, has done. But he, he has always understood that international relations was critical to the economic um, security and, and uh, ultimately the, the, you know, the future of the United States. And what I found, uh, I'm also someone who you know, had, uh, has had some experience abroad before, uh, before joining the department. And, you know, I have to say, I, I feel so fortunate. I went to really wonderful educational institutions. But I have to say the best education for me was travel, was living in other countries. And all of this, I think, just gives you a, a different perspective on, you know, a, a global perspective. That may be an, an overused term, but it's, uh, it may be cliched, but it's, it's true. You just, you, ha you actually see things from a different perspective. You have to, you understand you know, I remember a secretary caring saying, you may not agree with the other person who's sitting across the table, but you've got to, you've got to be able to, you know, sit where they're sitting and understand their perspective. And so you've got to be a good listener. You've got to understand why they're saying what they're saying and, and what doing what they're doing. Again, you may not agree with it. You may take issue with it and you may violently oppose it, but you've got to understand it. And I think that that, I think it gives you that sort of uh, perspective. So as an ambassador, you know, I felt that, again, I, I wasn't there to make policy. And uh, what most ambassadors are there to do is to communicate what the United States stands for, its values, and what its policies are. And in some cases, ambassadors are there to implement that policy. And obviously, it depends on the country, because there are some countries where, you know, the ambassador is a, just a linchpin in the future of, of the particular country. Again, I remember the secretary saying that some of our ambassadors were literally holding these countries together. They were such important advisors to the government, and they had such an important voice in, in what was happening. So ambassadors play a different role, but ultimately, you know, I think being a good listener, understanding what's happening, having, it, having that perspective is critical. Yeah, and I think that, the, as you note, perspective and, and knowing where the other person is coming from ties back to history in such important ways. And knowing the national history of the country you're dealing with and the, the personal history of where that, how that person fits into that national history and helps you get to that perspective. And I think it's vitally important in, in diplomacy and foreign affairs. David, thank you so much for being with us today. Fascinating talk, fascinating book. And listeners, once again, the title of that book is Watching Darkness Fall, FDR, His Ambassadors, and the Rise of Adolf Hitler. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Kelly, I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. That was Diplomatic Community. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen. And tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other major podcast platforms. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast and for ISD's research on the new global commons. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work. We look forward to bringing you more new content in season four of Diplomatic Community later this year. Until we meet again.